Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich. Today we're going to be in conversation about the life of Toussaint Louverture and the history of the Haitian Revolution, a slave revolt that turned Haiti into the first modern black-led independent state. For this conversation, we are joined by Sudhir Hazara Singh. He is a fellow at the British Academy and he is the author of the book that we will be in conversation about, Black Spartacus, the Epic Life of Toussaint Louverture. He joins us via Zoom. Sudhir Hazara Singh, it is my very good pleasure to welcome you to this radio program. Thanks for having me, Mitch. It's good to have you. I, I've, I've been wanting to do a show uh, about Toussaint Louverture, so very excited when I, when I found your book. And in this book, you write that the Haitian Revolution, that which really spans between 1791 and, and 1804, um, is, is, is an era of revolutions. This is an era shortly before we have the French Revolution, the American Revolution, but you also write that there's something very different about the Haitian Revolution that sets it apart from these other revolutions. And I guess that main issue would be it taking on slavery. Yes, indeed, Mitch. Um, it's, I mean, the Haitian Revolution is, I think, the most remarkable revolution in this period when we have quite a lot of revolutionary activity. And I think it's the most remarkable revolution because it's the most comprehensive revolution of, of its kind. Um, I mean, the French Revolution is aspires to be um, quite a radical revolution. It talks about liberty, equality, and fraternity. But um, on the issue of slavery, it's actually um, quite hesitant. And of course, um, although it abolishes slavery in 1794, um, the French actually reimpose it uh, under Napoleon in 1802. As for the American Revolution, it, it, it's, it's, it's a radical revolution in, in a sense, of course, in that it breaks away from, from the British Empire. But as we all know, on the issue of slavery, the American Revolution doesn't actually uh, do anything. Um, until much later, uh, abolition comes um, under Abraham Lincoln. So the Haitian Revolution is much more comprehensive than um, these two revolutions on this issue of slavery, but also on a wider set of issues. Because if you think of a revolution as uh, a process of social change, which involves um, the citizenry as a whole, then I think what one can say about both the American and the French revolutions is that they were, they, people were involved, of course, but um, the, involve, the level of involvement was uneven and, and at times it was only a minority of people who, who were involved. What's extraordinary about the Haitian revolution, and this is true both at the beginning and in the final stages, is that it is almost literally a nation in arms. It's the whole people who rise up initially to um, uh, uh, call for um, emancipation. And, and so the fight for emancipation from, from slavery is one that is waged by basically all the adult slave and slaved men and women. And then when you get to the final stage, the war of national liberation against the invading French army, again, it's pretty much the whole people. Um, who fight this war, fight off the French who've come back to try and enslave um, the Haitian people and defeat them, leading to the creation of the, the modern state of Haiti. So in these respects, I think there's something very special about the Haitian Revolution. The Haitian Revolution has often been portrayed in, in the telling of this story as a product of, of something that was born out of the, the French Revolution. Do you think that's accurate? And I was very interested to hear that France abolishes slavery in 1794 when the Haitian Revolution begins in 1791. Uh, and so did, did the Haitian Revolution play a role in France abolishing slavery? Absolutely. And that's one of the many things which even to this day, people in France um, don't know or don't know enough that you know the French, when they think about abolition, they, they, they always talk about this date of 1794, which was of course an important date, because that was when the French National Assembly of the time, the Convention, proclaimed the abolition of slavery in all French colonies. 
Um, but the reason this happened in the first place and, and what made it possible was that um, the enslaved men and women of, of Saint-Domingue, as, as it was called um, uh, before 1804, the French colony of Saint-Domingue, these enslaved men and women rose, uh, carried out an uprising against, um, against their masters and basically forced the French authorities to grant them freedom. And, and that abolition uh, happens in 1793. So um, Saint-Domingue uh, and, and its revolution uh, literally paves the way for the abolition of slavery, um, uh, which is decreed by the French Revolution a year later. And the French Revolution would begin in 1789. How, how do you see the connection of the Haitian Revolution to the French Revolution? Well, I think the connection is there, uh, undoubtedly, because um, we have um, uh, documented evidence that um, uh, both people and material coming from France, because of course there was regular connections between the metropole and uh, Saint-Domingue, which was at the time France's wealthiest colony. So you had very regular uh, 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 commercial ships um, uh, uh, connecting the two. So as soon as the revolution breaks out in France, you start to see uh, ideas about the revolution um, spreading um, in, in Saint-Domingue. However, there's one important qualification here, which is that um, as soon as these ideas start to spread, um, they are captured, in a way, by um, the local white settlers in Saint-Domingue. And um, they're captured in two ways. One is um, the local white settlers, of course, don't want to grant any uh, uh, free, free rights uh, of citizenship to their slaves. They don't want to emancipate them. So they, 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 they begin to argue that the ideas of the French Revolution should not be applied to the colonies. And they managed to persuade the French revolutionaries of that. That's one of the most shameful early episodes in the history of the French Revolution, when in 1791, the National Assembly basically hands over uh, all uh, policies towards uh, the slaves back to the local planters. But the planters also do something very um, interesting, which is to claim that in the name of the um, principles of freedom, that they should be the ones who should have the right to decide um, what should happen in a colony like Saint-Domingue. So in a sense, um, the French planters um, capture, um, almost subvert the principles of the French Revolution to their own ends. However, having said that, um, some of these radical ideas about freedom, about equality, about justice, about brotherhood. Some of these ideas are heard, are overheard by the enslaved men and women, and they start to talk about them. And, and it's partly on that basis that the slaves, uh, uh, in, the slave insurrection takes place in 1791. But I say partly because actually, um, and that's the other thing that uh, is often missing in this story, uh, particularly when it's told in France, the enslaved men and women didn't wait for the French Revolution to tell them that slavery was a bad thing. They knew it already, and they knew it all along. And when you look at the history of resistance to enslavement in the, in the colony of Saint-Domingue, Saint-Domingue had been a French colony since the late 17th century. When you look at that, the history of that resistance, you see that there's a very long and rich and detailed tradition of uh, resistance, which is a local tradition. And, and so when the slaves um, revolt in 1791, I would say they're drawing on both of these traditions. Right? They're drawing on the French Revolution in part, although they're very frustrated that the French Revolution doesn't want to support them initially. Um, but I think that's why, in a sense, more important is this local indigenous tradition of resistance, um, the tradition of uh, maronage, as it's called, maroon, um, maroon slaves. And that is uh, also the tradition which shapes the um, political thought and practice of Toussaint Louverture. T tell me about Saint-Domingue. Again, this is the name of Haiti before 1804, before it becomes an independent country. Um, t tell me about Saint-Domingue in, in the 18th century, before the 
revolution. This this is one of the most resource rich places in the entire world, isn't it? It's an extraordinary place. Um, it's a bit of a backwater when the French take over in the late seventeenth um, century, but by by uh, the eighteen twenties or the eighteen thirties, it's already starting to prosper, um, and um, by by the middle and 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 the and the second and the third and the second half of the 18th century it flourishes as the most prosperous colony um uh, the french have it's called one of its nicknames is the pearl of the antilles and that's because it produces a huge um amounts of cotton coffee cocoa um indigo um uh and um, generates an enormous amount of wealth for the French um, exchequer through through uh, through taxation, and so this is a phenomenally wealthy uh, place. However, um, this wealth is based entirely on forced labour, because um, by the time you get to um, the end of the 18th century, the population is roughly as follows: about 30,000 um, white settlers about 30,000 um, people of mixed race and 500,000 um, uh, uh, black men and women, uh, the, the majority of whom were born in Africa, captured and forcibly transported to Saint-Domingue. Let's get into the story of Toussaint Louverture, whose original name was Toussaint Breda, and Breda was the name of, of the plantation. Um, Toussaint Louverture, if we wanted to compare it to, say, you know, a, a historic story from the United States, say like Frederick Douglass, who was also born into slavery, but as a pretty young man, adult young man, escaped slavery, Toussaint Louverture doesn't really es leave the plantation until, what, nearly 50 years of age? Yes, um, that's one of the many uh, remarkable things about him. Um, I mean, it gives us all hope in a way that, you know, uh, one can remain idealistic even um, uh, until a, a ripe old age. And he, by the time the, the revolution breaks out in 1791, he's already, um, you know, at least 50 years old. And he's lived all of those 50 years, um, 50 plus years, on this uh, relatively small plantation in the north of Saint-Domingue, the north being the most um, fertile uh, uh, part of the territory. Um, Saint-Domingue, Haiti, is very mountainous, so the central parts of the, um, of the territory are very, uh, very high, very difficult to grow um, very much on it. So you have these few small um, fertile plains, but extraordinarily fertile where um, you can grow um, uh, uh, crops of very, very high quality. And the sugar that was produced, particularly in the north, was of exceptionally good quality. And so Toussaint grows up on this plantation. And um, uh, as with most um, enslaved people, we have a lot of details about his life that are missing. I mean, this was one of the frustrating things uh, I went to the archives hoping that I would find things about all the periods of his life. And I found huge um, amount of documentation about his life as a revolutionary after 1791. But for the whole of the first 50 years of his life, they're literally just two or three documents. So we don't know exactly even, for example, when he was born exactly. We don't know. Uh, I mean, we know because um, it's been confirmed by, by several sources that he was emancipated, almost certainly by the plantation manager uh, whose assistant he became. And basically he worked very closely with um, uh, this plantation manager, a man called Bayon de Libertad. But we don't have the exact date of that uh, manumission. Um, so there are a lot of uh, phases of his early life that we're still learning about. Um, some historians only quite recently discovered that um, uh, until, um, I mean, we all thought he was married to a lady called Suzanne, who gave him three children. But it turns out that he had he had, had an earlier marriage in the 1860s to another woman. 1760s uh, or? I'm sorry? 1760s? In the 1760s, exactly. Um, 
uh, he, start, he, he starts to live with, um, with Suzanne in the early 1780s, but, um, but he had been married before and had had several children. So all of these stories, um, I mean, it, it may well be that we will find out more information from the archives, but, but that part of his life still remains um, relatively uh, unknown. Yeah. And I should add that while he stayed with the plantation for quite some time, he, he was freed earlier, but then elected to stay. And I don't know, I don't know if that'd be the proper term, elected to stay. I don't know if you have much of a choice, uh, but stayed with the, the Breda plantation after, after he was freed. I think he was freed right around 1776. Um, Exactly. And, and I think, you know, and some people have kind of wondered why he did that. And then what I argue in the book is that, you know, you just have to use some common sense here. Although he was emancipated, his wife wasn't, uh, nor were his children, because we have found uh, a register um, of slaves. As you know, uh, plantations kept these registers with, with all the slaves named. And what you see from the 1780s is that... Um, Toussaint still appears on the register. Actually, these, it's an, the other thing about these registers is that they're not necessarily completely accurate because even though we found this register from the 1780s, by which time we knew, we know that Toussaint had been emancipated, this register still has him down as a slave. But the reason he is there is because his family is still there and, and they are still um, enslaved. And, uh, and part of the plantation. So he's not going to abandon them uh, and, and go, go somewhere else. He, he chose to stay with his family. So I'm assuming this lack of documentation before the revolution will make my next question perhaps difficult to answer, but I'll ask it anyways, is how does Toussaint Louverture, who is connected to this Breda plantation, turn into a revolutionary leader? Well, that's, that was one of the uh, many challenging um, uh, questions I had to try and deal with. And I think the way to think about it is to think about um, Saint-Domingue as really, particularly the north of Saint-Domingue, as really a very fertile ground, not just for plantation, but also for revolution. Um, because this is a place where you have a lot of revolutionary ideas circulating during the second half of the 18th century. And, and because Toussaint Louverture is, is physically located almost sort of at, at the epicenter of these revolutionary activities, um, he's someone who imbibes um, all these different um, forms of rebellion and, um, you know, stores them up, as it were, um, for future use. And, 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 and these revolutionary ideas, some of them come from the church. Uh, you know, the Jesuits were very, some Jesuits were quite radical um, in the colonies. And in fact, they were so radical that the French kicked them out in, in 1765 because, you know, uh, genu genuine Christians really do believe that all human beings are equal and therefore you know, um, that means slaves are, are equal as well. And the French authorities weren't terribly happy to, to see um, preachers um, uh, sending out that message. So they kicked the Jesuits out. But Toussaint, Toussaint's ideas um, about social life were formed in part by, by the Jesuits. But then there was also this uh, revolutionary tradition of um, of the slaves themselves. And Toussaint would have been very closely um, connected to that. Um, and indeed, we know that the 1791 uprising was planned by um, um, what, what used, what, what's referred to as the sort of elite of the plantation uh, 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 slave population, you know, the coach, coachmen, the artisans, um, the drivers, um, all of the people who basically helped um, keep the plantation system going. So in a sense, they were part of the system, but they were working from inside to undermine it. Um, and Toussaint, we believe, and, and there's a lot of indirect evidence that I talk about in the book, we believe that Toussaint was very much involved in the planning of the 1791 insurrection too. But, but the basic point about Toussaint is that his um, revolutionary ideas come from a number of different sources, right? So Christianity, um, uh, 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 um, 
the, the, the revolutionary tradition of the slaves themselves, French revolutionary ideas. And last but not least, um, there's also Vodou, you know, the, the natural religion of the Haitian people to this day. And by the late 18th century, Vodou um, is already emerging as a dominant spiritual force among the, um, the black population. And although Toussaint has a rather complicated relationship with Vodou, um, it is something that, um, that, uh, that he uh, is inspired by as well. So it's all of these different things um, that shape his, his way of thinking and his way of being. Toussaint was also a military man, and he served for the French in this. And would it be accurate to say, and Toussaint would die before the Haiti would gain its independence, but would it be accurate to say that Toussaint, at least originally, was set out to end slavery, not necessarily free Haiti from France? Well, that's... Um one of the kind of big questions which people are still um, arguing about up to this day. Uh, and, I mean, I think what he was aiming to do, at least in the short run, and I think on that there, there really is no debate, in the short run, his aim was to preserve uh, Saint-Domingue within the French colonial empire um, for a very simple reason, because he thought that that was the best protection that the revolution could have. Um, because, you know, one has to bear in mind that in the late 18th, early 19th century, it was a very hostile world that uh, any kind of self-governing black republic would come into. And Toussaint knew that um, if he went for independence, um, that that would basically unite all the imperial powers against him. So, I mean, and, and one of the things you, you realize when you, when you look at Toussaint very closely is that he's very savvy, not just in terms of his domestic politics, but he has a very sophisticated understanding of, of global politics at the time. He deals directly with the British, with the Spanish, uh, with the Americans, and, and, and President Adams is actually quite sympathetic towards uh, the Louverture regime. Unfortunately, when Jefferson arrives, um, things take a turn for the worst. Oh, but, that's interesting. But Toussaint understands this world uh, 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 and the world, the world which it would potentially be very hostile to an independent black republic. And therefore, he's trying to do everything he can to allow the revolution in his country to prosper without at the same time attracting um, uh, the attacks from, from, from externally. So I think in the short run, Toussaint definitely wanted to remain um, uh, on very good terms with the French, provided, of course, the French reciprocated. And sadly, for, for the way the story ended, the French uh, stupidly decided to attack Toussaint and, and try and re-enslave the Haitian people. And, and they paid a very high price for that. This is Letters in Politics, and we are in conversation with Sudhir Hazara Singh. He is a fellow at the British Academy, and we are talking about his book, Black Spartacus, The Epic Life of Toussaint L'Ouverture. Um, that, that was interesting, the, the difference between John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. This is the second and the third president of the United States. And I, I, that, that was, I didn't know that, that there was a shift. I don't know if it was a shift of policy, but at least a, a shift, it sounds like, of sentiment at the, at the minimum between John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. What more can you tell me about that? Well, Adams was a man who um, was much firmer in his abolitionist convictions. Um, I mean, Jefferson didn't have any anyway. <laughs> he was someone who owned slaves, as, as we all know now. And he was very hostile for that reason to the Haitian Revolution. Uh, there's a letter that he writes uh, when referring to the, um, the, the revolution in Saint-Domingue, where he calls uh, Toussaint and his comrades cannibals. Um, so, and this is before, I think, um, Jefferson becomes president. So he's already someone who is thinking about this issue from the, from the vantage point of the slave owners. Um, and and that's, that's the way he thinks about politics more generally, of course. Um, so I don't think it was terribly surprising that Jefferson, um, once he became president, took a much less uh, benign view of the Haitian Revolution. Um, because, you know, it has to be said, um, the, the, 
the worry, and not just in the United States, but the worry in in the Caribbean, where the, whether it was um, the, the British Empire or the Spanish Empire, the worry was that the Haitian Revolution would be contagious, right, and would provoke um, uh, rebellions and, and revolutions um, from the slaves um, in all of these different places. And to a certain extent, it did, right? Um, so that is, that is you know, uh, Jefferson was right to be worried, um, but, um, but Adams, you know, um, because he was, uh, uh, I guess, more, uh, more committed to, to this idea of Republican equality, was someone who um, was willing to at least open up um, economic relations with, with Toussaint and his regime. Tell me about Toussaint Lo, uh, Breda becoming Toussaint Louverture and the significance of, of the name change. He would adopt this name Louverture later on. Yes, well, it was a, it was a really big symbolic moment for him because... Um, you know, throughout much, most of his adult life, um, you know, he was already 50, as we've said, uh, he was known by the name of his plantation, which was really the way, um, which was one further way in which uh, enslaved people were robbed of their identity, right? They lost whatever, whatever name uh, they had, and, and they were tied to their plantation, literally, by their name. So when Toussaint joins the insurrection, um, he decides he has to choose a, a new name for himself. And he chooses this name Louverture, which is wonderfully clever because it's facing both ways. It's on the one hand, it's uh, ouverture in French means opening. So he's talking about himself as someone who's going to create openings, uh, make a new departure. You know, um, so it's a very revolutionary name, which which is is gesturing at the French Enlightenment and the idea of um, you know opening the mind as well. So it's a name which, for a long time, people thought was further evidence that Toussaint was a sort of disciple of the French Revolution and of French um, political culture. However, when you also look at um, uh, the Vodou. Um, culture of the time, you see that, um, uh, you know, in, in the Vodou tradition, there are a lot of different spirits who, who each perform different roles and different functions. Um, and one of these spirits is called Legba. Um, and Legba's role, Papa Legba, um, is the person, is the spirit who helps people make the transition from one uh, uh, part of their life to another. Uh, he's 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 known as the sort of guardian of the crossroads. So he's also someone who um, makes an opening, right? He, he takes people through the crossroads onto um, the better the better phase um, of their existence. So um, uh, it, it's really a, a very clever move by Toussaint because he's also by choosing that name addressing his own people and his own supporters, um, as well as the, the French. What's really remarkable to me, and you mentioned this earlier, is that about 60% of the people in this period of time, the late 18th century in Haiti, not named Haiti yet, Saint Domingue, uh, Saint-Domingue, um, are from Africa. They were kidnapped from Africa and enslaved in, in, in Saint-Domingue. And that What's remarkable about what Toussaint Louverture was able to do was sort of you try to unite these different people. They all weren't all from the same particular area. They didn't all speak the same language. They didn't all necessarily immediately see themselves as a as as a, as a single body. But yet, and that was a, a major thing that Toussaint Louverture and the revolution itself uh, would would have to figure out, and, and obviously it did. Yes, I think, I mean, he, he did so many remarkable, exceptional things, but perhaps this one was one of the, one of the greatest, because in 1791, um, although there are 500,000 um, uh, African, uh, you know, men and women of African origin, and, and as we said, most of them born in Africa, um, they absolutely were not what you would call a people. You know, to be a people, you have to have um, not just uh, shared uh, uh, 
uh, geographical origins, but you have to have a common purpose, right? You have to, you have to uh, uh, be part of a common project, a common endeavor. And that's what Toussaint is able to do, even, even while these people continue to have different religious beliefs, speak different languages, um, but he forges a sense of unity among them. And, and this emphasis on black unity is one of his uh, leitmotifs. You know, when you, when you read all his speeches, he's a, he's a great speech giver in the 1790s. But you see, wherever he goes, he talks about uh, whether he's talking to uh, people in towns or, 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 or in the plantations, wherever he's talking to his black brothers and sisters, he says, we must remain united. And, and, and unity is the absolutely uh, essential objective um, that we must pursue. And, and, and that's one of the things that he, um, he achieves, right? Because even, <clears throat> even by the late um, 1790s, you can see it from, from his own, from the support that he has, from the reports that the French are sending back to, to Paris. Um, the, 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 uh, the black people of Saint-Domingue are completely united behind him. And, and it's that unity that makes it possible for them to take on the French after 1802 and defeat them. So black unity is an absolutely uh, fundamental achievement um, of Toussaint Louverture. And in that sense, I think one can rightly see him as one of the um, founding fathers of, of the modern Haitian state, even though, um, as we said, he was no longer alive when Haiti became an independent state. Does the religion of voodoo play a key role in this unification of the people? Yeah. Yes, and I think um, one of the one of the ways in which um, the people come together. Um, I mean, there are a number of ways in which they do. Of course, there's a political project which which they share in, which is to to to, to buy into these these principles of freedom, equality, and brotherhood. The French Re the French revolutionary principles. Um, the other way in which people are. Are, are connected is through um, the common language, which is a, which is Haitian Creole, you know, as, as we know it today. But you know, the Creole of Saint Domingue was already there in the um, in the late 18th century, and it's a wonderfully rich, colorful um, language, which Toussaint Louverture himself spoke, um, you know, um, every day on, on a regular basis. In fact, that's the other interesting thing for the biographer. There's a slight um, there's a slight gap because all the material that I have, I'd say 99% of the material that I have in the French archives is written in French, um, even even if it's uh, uh, a letter or a speech by Toussaint Louverture himself. But but I know from other sources that he's someone who spoke a lot every day in Creole uh, and probably thought in Creole as well. So it's really interesting to think of how someone was um, uh, shaping his ideas um, uh, in one language, but then also was capable of expressing himself um, in another. So the language is also very important. And then there's um, the spiritual side, which is Vodou, which is very widely practiced by, um, by the black people of Saint-Domingue. So it's those, it's those three things that serve as the unific unific unifying factors. What's important to know about the indigenous people of Haiti. My, my understanding is even the word Haiti itself, uh, isn't, it, is, isn't it akin to what the Taino people who were the indigenous people? Of That's right. The, the Taino people were the indigenous people um, of, uh, uh, of Saint-Domingue. And of course, they didn't call it Saint-Domingue. Um, they gave it a number of different names. And uh, one of those names was Haiti, um, which means literally uh, land of mountains. And so it's a very good, um, uh, quick description of, of what the island um, is about. And even though um, most of them had actually, um, sadly, uh, died by the time, long before Toussaint Louverture appears on, on the stage, one of the things that uh, anthropologists have now started to uh, piece together when looking at 18th century Saint-Domingue is that a lot of um, the values and the practices of the Taino um, survived. Um, and they survived in part through 
the, their interactions with uh, maroon slaves. One of the things that we now know is that when slaves ran away from the plantations in the um, in the late um, uh, um, late seventeenth, early eighteenth century, they were often picked up by or, or, or found shelter um, in communities where um, uh, some Taino uh, populations had survived, and and so there was a kind of fusion of um, uh, uh, Taino uh, practices and beliefs and um, an African uh, 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 spiritual practices and beliefs. And so this, this entity that we describe, this, this um, system of values that we think of as voodoo, um, it's not just purely one thing. It, it's something that emerges as a result of um, a combination of values from um, uh, these different sources. And there was a lot of overlap. Um, that one of the things that Taino people were known for was their, 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 their humanity, um, their kindness. They were very gentle um, people, um, very, very peaceful, very peace-loving. Um, and of course, that, that, that sense of the world as being one of harmony and, and one of peace is one that came from many um, uh, African nat natural religions as well. Uh, so these two things came together, as it were, to shape the way in which the Vodou religion um, developed. Talk to me about the back and forward of this revolution from 1791 to 1804 and, and the struggle between the Haitian people uh, and the French colonial power. Uh, I mean, this would, and you mentioned it later, once Napoleon would rise to power in France, even after slavery was abolished, he tried to, to reinstate slavery. Can, can you tell me, just sort of go through the span of what happens between, this is a big question, I understand, <laughs> but between 1791 and 1804? Well, um, there's three or four basic phases. Um, from 1791 to 1794, um, basically, um, the French are dealing with um, the question of abolition, um, and they're more or less forced to recognize the power of the black population and grant them their freedom. So that, that would be the first phase. Then from 1794 onwards, Toussaint Louverture becomes basically the main uh, leader um, of the black population in Saint-Domingue. And I'd say this is the period when he slowly builds up his uh, power base um, in the colony, working alongside the French and, and, and being a general in the French army. So he's someone who is part of the French system, but he also is someone who is steadily building his own power and also the power of Saint-Domingue against metropolitan France. And up to 1798, Toussaint is basically fighting mainly the British and the Spanish, who, are who were trying to maintain a foothold on the island. Uh, Toussaint kicks the British out in 1798, and by 1801, um, he's, all, he's completely unified the whole of the island of, his of Hispaniola under uh, French Republican rule. He basically boots the Spaniards out of the eastern uh, two-thirds uh, of, the, of the territory. Um, this is to speak of it in, in today's terms, this is where the Dominican Republic is today. If you think of the island of Hispaniola today, the, the eastern part is the Dominican Republic, the western part is Haiti. Basically, Toussaint took over the whole island um, for a brief period. And by 1801, um, he's running the entire place. Um, however, by then, um, he's um, also um, engaged in a, a tug of war with the French because the French don't want uh, uh, black people to be running the island and they don't, especially don't want Toussaint Louverture to be um, the dominant figure. So Napoleon then decides to um, teach them a lesson and, and sends uh, his invading army to try and capture Toussaint and try and basically re-enslave um, the, the black people of Saint-Domingue. And although Toussaint himself is captured in 1802, um, he, um, his lieutenants continue the fight and uh, they defeat the French and uh, the independent state of Haiti is born in 1804. What happens to Toussaint Louverture in, uh, after being captured? <laughs> 
So he's captured and immediately sent, put on a ship with his immediate close, close family. And the ship sets sails to France. Um, he's taken to a very remote fortress in the eastern part of the country um, called the Fort de Joux. Um, very cold, very uh, uh, a desolate um, place. And um, he's basically locked up there. Uh, and, um, and basically... Um, uh, treated so badly that um, that he dies uh, the following year. So he dies in um, uh, in 1803. But by then the situation on the ground has already turned uh, 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 away from uh, the French and and in favour of the, the resistance movement that Toussaint had had created. Did were were people in in, in Saint Domingue to become Haiti shortly after? Were they paying attention to what happened to to Toussaint Louverture? Was there a lot of tension even in France on the on uh, the captivity of of Toussaint Louverture? Well, not not very much, to be honest, because you know, uh, I mean, the main the main struggle uh, in Saint Domingue itself was, you know, it, it was a war of war of liberation. So that so they were they were they were fighting to get rid of the get rid of the French. Um, and the new leadership, um, uh, as, as often happens in these circumstances, they were also trying to do their best to draw attention to themselves rather than to uh, 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 give credit to Toussaint Louverture. But, you know, any, any objective historian would see, well, one obvious thing is that all of these military figures who fought uh, the War of National uh, Independence were all Toussaint's officers, right? He picked them. Every single one of them, and um, uh, 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 they rose through the ranks under his command. So they were his, they were his disciples. He trained them, um, and um, and later on, um, you know, many of them gave him this this credit that he had been one of the founding uh, fathers of uh, of Haitian independence. How do you see the legacy of both Toussaint Louverture and the Haitian Revolution? Well, I, I write a couple of chapters at the end of the book about this, and I think it, it's really uh, uh, a remarkable legacy because when you look at the fight for emancipation uh, from slavery across the Atlantic world in the 19th century, and, and it's a long struggle, right? Let's not forget that you know uh, it, it lasts. Slavery lasts until the 1860s in America, um, until the 1880s in Cuba. Um, uh, and um, it continues um, even when it's been formally abolished in certain parts of the British Empire until even the 20th century. So this isn't over when, but you know, by any stretch of the imagination, by the time Haiti is born. So it's a long struggle. And what is really remarkable is that wherever they are struggling, whether it's in the Caribbean, the United States, you know, you mentioned Frederick Douglass. I found a lot of material, you know, speeches that Frederick Douglass gives, where he talks very enthusiastically about Toussaint Louverture, who was one of his idols, and and and, and Frederick Douglass was, you know, obsessed with the Haitian Revolution. He thought it was one of the most remarkable. He was one of the few people in uh, in his time to actually see the, the remarkably radical character of the Haitian Revolution. So, what you see is. This whole struggle for emancipation is a struggle which is in part inspired by, by the ideas and by the example of uh, Toussaint Louverture and by the Haitian Revolution. And then by the time you get to the 20th century, with the struggle against uh, European, you know, classical European empires, um, Toussaint Louverture and the Haitians reemerge again. And, and you see it in the writings of people like Franz Fanon, or um, Aimé Césaire, um, or C.L.R. James um, in the English-speaking world. These are all people who played a very prominent role in the struggle against colonial rule and whose, um, whose thinking was very much shaped by um, uh, uh, the Haitian Revolution. C.L.R. James wrote Black Jacobin. Your, your book's called Black Spartacus. My understanding is... Toussaint Louverture is actually called Black Spartacus and, and liked that uh, 
uh, liked that name uh, during his time. Uh, but I, I've also heard in preparing for our conversation that you see your book as, if I mischaracterize this, you will correct me, as sort of a companion book to C.L.R. James Black Jacobins. Can, can you talk to me about the importance of, of that book, The Black Jacobins? Well, I think C.L.R. James's book is, you know, remains um, the classic book about the Haitian Revolution because it's a book that was first published in in the late 1930s, um, and and it basically it was the book that sort of accompanied a lot of the people who were fighting this uh, struggle for uh, freedom from colonial rule. Um, uh, 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 C.L.R. James uh, publishes a, a second edition of it in the early 1960s. So this is really a book which is about <coughs> um, post-colonialism, but so, so it's about the 18th century, but it's also a book which tells us a lot about the history of 20th century anti-colonialism and, and the place that uh, Toussaint Louverture and, and the Haitians played in it. So it's an absolutely um, seminal um, book um, in the context of its time. Um, and I see my book as a complement to it. Complement because, although I think it is absolutely right to think of Toussaint as, a, as someone who was shaped by um, the French Revolution and, and, and the ideas of the French Revolution, um, there was much more to him than that. And, and, and it's those other dimensions of his of his character, of his ideas, of his values that I try and bring out in the book, uh, the extent to which he was shaped by his African heritage, of which he was very proud, and also the extent to which he was a son of the Caribbean, you know, a devout Catholic, someone who identified with uh, the Vodou uh, uh, spirit, spiritualism in, in a certain way, and also someone who um, you know, uh, uh, was inspired by the activities of the um, slave resistance from from Saint Domingue. So it's it's that much richer, um, much more complex um, set of dimensions um, that I try and bring in my own book, while acknowledging that um, C. L. R. James is, in a sense, the the pioneer in terms of our our understanding of Toussaint Louverture. Do you think that the historiography, the telling, the history of the telling of the story of Toussaint Louverture has underplayed Toussaint's Africanness? Yes, because um, for a long time, this was a story that was told by people who, you know, um, in one way or another, were inspired by um, radical ideas that came from Europe. Uh, and particularly Marxism, and, and that was the case with C.L.R. James. And so when he's looking at the Haitian Revolution, you can see him still trying to basically apply um, a kind of slightly uh, 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 subtle version of Marxism uh, uh, to, um, to, this, uh, to this event. Um, and, and it helps in some, in some degree, but of course the problem with Marxism is that it was always very um, dismissive of any political tradition that was um, not European, not in, not indigenous to Europe, because Marx believed that liberation would only come from the most of what he saw as the most advanced um, part of the uh, global capitalist economy, and and for him that meant that meant uh, uh, Western Europe, in fact. And, and, and something of that survived in the historiography and, and people tried to see Toussaint as someone who believed in, 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 in modernizing um, uh, uh, Saint-Domingue society and, and therefore making it more European in a way. Whereas um, I think Toussaint did have that. And, and you know, I, I'm not one who, who thinks that one should dismiss the, the importance of, of that part of him. But what's great about him is that he he brings everything together. You know, uh, he doesn't reject um, stuff. He, he's someone who who tries to see the good side in everything, um, and and you know, and that even included um, the white settlers, uh, the people who had maintained um, his brothers and sisters in slavery. He reaches out to them and tries to tries to work with them. Um, you know, he was. Um, there's something of the Nelson Mandela. Uh, I always think of that analogy 
um, when, when, when I think about Toussaint Louverture, because it takes an extraordinary um, sense of confidence and, and courage and, and forgiveness to be able to turn around to the people who've tortured you and, and your people and say to them, you know, uh, I want you to be part of this new political order that I'm going to be uh, building. But that that was that was that was Toussaint. That was the magic that he brought to uh, to his politics. And I suspect there is a lot of pressure from other Black Haitians not to reach out to to whites. Yes, absolutely. And in fact, when you look at South African politics today, you see those tensions too, right? I mean, a lot of people in the African National Congress feel that the compromise was one that was too favorable to the whites um, and and still believe that, you know, there should be, uh, uh, you know, land should be taken from them and, and redistributed. So so this is a debate that you always have, in a sense, um, in, in revolutionary situations. But I think the, 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 the evidence suggests that that way of doing things um, is the one that, at least in the short run, um, guarantees the greatest uh, amount of, of stability. And I think if, Toussaint, if the Toussaint experiment had been allowed to continue, that's what you would have got. You would have gotten a situation in which, um, you know, um, the economy would have prospered. Um, but, you know, there would have been, there would have been difficulties. And, and I, I acknowledge them in the book. Um, uh, uh, it was quite an, an inegalitarian society. And, and many of the black plantation workers felt slightly shortchanged. Um, under, under, under Toussaint, because they felt that, um, you know, having fought for their freedom and uh, having fought for liberation, they felt that it wasn't, um, you know, it wasn't good enough for them then just to end up as uh, uh, wage laborers in a plantation which continued to be run by um, by the white elite. Mm -hmm. So there was there was some dissatisfaction definitely um, at this situation but Toussaint felt that you know if you if, if you wanted the revolution to survive in Saint-Domingue you had no option it, it is remarkable to think about the richness of Saint-Domingue of Haiti in the 18th century and then the poverty that would follow after independence yes um and I think um without wanting to necessarily to uh, blame just one party. I think a big part of this story uh, uh, and the reason for this poverty, again, has to be laid at, um, at the doors of the French. Because what happens is that Haiti becomes independent in 1804, and the French and all the other imperial powers refuse to recognize it um, and basically blockade um, this new uh, nation state until the 1820s, um, and basically at, at pretty much at gunpoint, force the, the leaders of the independent state to sign a, an economic uh, a agreement, according to which the, the Haitian government um, gives uh, an indemnity to the French to compensate the slave owners for losing their property, because slaves, as you know, used to be thought of as property. And so that is one of the kind of greatest crimes of the 19th century. You know, the French force this independent state, uh, whose people had suffered for 100 years under slavery, forces them to compensate the slave owners. And this basically uh, da severely damages the Haitian economy in the 19th century. And, you know, the, the, the Haitians only fully repaid this debt because uh, they had to borrow. To, to pay it, they only fully repaid it in the mid 20th century. So um, it had a very uh, devastating impact on the Haitian economy and triggered uh, a lot of the political instability that we've seen uh, in, in subsequent Haitian history. Sudhir Hazara Singh has been our guest. He is the author of the book that we have been in conversation about. It's called Black Spartacus, The Epic Life of Toussaint Louverture. Sudhir Hazara Singh, I've enjoyed our conversation very much, and I thank you greatly for taking this time to talk to us today. Thanks for having me, Mitch. It's a real pleasure.